One of the main stories that we hear about climate today is that livestock is bad and that therefore we need to switch to more of a plant-based diet. I'd like to share with you some information along those lines. One of the main things that we hear is that we hear overgeneralizations. We hear all livestock grouped into one big lump irrespective of bad practices or good practices. And we hear uh, the plant-based diet is one big thing, irrespective of good practices or bad practices. But either can include good practices and bad practices, and whether it's a good or bad practice, it makes all the difference in whether it produces greenhouse gases or not, whether it's good or bad for water quality, whether it's good or bad for erosion, uh, whether it's good or bad for the soil structure, etc., whether it's good or bad for nutrition. So let's look at that. So here we go. This is an article from the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation. It, the lead author is Richard is a William Teague from Texas A&M. And the title is The Role of Ruminants in Reducing Agriculture's Carbon Footprint in North America. The title suggests that uh, ruminants, that is cattle, sheep, and goats, could actually reduce the carbon footprint of agriculture in North America. In other words, ruminants could be part of the solution, not just part of the problem. So let's see what that's about. Here's a quote from the article. It says, the problems of many current tillage-based practices, tillage-based cropping and feedlot-based livestock production systems can be avoided by ecologically sensitive management of ruminants in mixed crop and grazing ecosystems. In other words, we're not going to have the animals on one farm and the crops on another farm. We're going to actually mix the crops and the livestock. And crops can be grown on a field that livestock occasionally graze. And livestock can, as part of their grazing rotation, graze on crop fields. And that can be a good thing as opposed to here's a crop that's just going to be here's a field that's just going to be used for crops year after year after year and we might we might uh, rotate corn soy and wheat but it's all crops all the time and over here here is a, a field where cattle graze and then we're going to graze the cattle on that field without very good rotating practices. And then at the end, they're going to get fattened on grain and that's just the way we do it. Uh, so uh, there's a, a different way, but they're saying that if we use a, a mixed crop and grazing agroecosystems, then the benefits can include increased carbon sequestration storing carbon in the soil, can in, uh, include improved soil nutrient cycling, which is good ecologically and good for production and good for the nutritional value of the foods that we get off the farm. Increased soil stability, that means we're not having as much erosion. Enhanced water se watershed function, that typically means that there's more of the rainfall is soaking into the ground uh, rather than running off. And enhanced biodiversity and wildlife habitat. So all these benefits of doing it right, and you would never know that by most of the reports that we get that, um, that just lump all the good practices and bad practices together. So here is a chart at the end of the article. Uh, these are the, the bad practices. In the next slide right here, I'm going to get to the good practices, but let's first look at the bad practices as summarized in the, this chart at the end of the article. So the approach 
is a cropping system that has annual tillage of large areas and the effect is extended periods of bare soil, increased runoff, soil erosion, loss of soil carbon, and uh, loss of soil carbon to the atmosphere as greenhouse gases. More erosion means more greenhouse gases. And another ap approach in the, among the bad management is monocultures of non-nitrogen fixing plants. You know, monocultures of corn uh, and a high volume and high cost fertilizer, herbicide, and pesticide inputs. So this is the way most farming is done and the most crop farming and the result is a decline in soil nitrogen. <laughs> if the soil nitrogen is going down then there's a perceived need to add more nitrogen from a bag. Decline in soil nitrogen, a decline in organic carbon, a decline in microbial diversity that's the soil ecosystem. You want your microbial diversity to increase, not decrease. You have a decline in fungal diversity, and you have a loss uh, to a loss of excess nitrogen to the water resources. So you have all this excess nitrogen from fertilizers that is running off into the water resources, and that excess nitrogen is becoming more greenhouse gases. So that's bad agriculture. <laughs> bad, at least in terms uh, for environmental reasons. And also, some would say, Gabe Brown would say, that this is bad for your profitability as well. Not only are you spending more on inputs, but you're losing so the soil health, which could be your biggest asset. Now let's go to the good practices. So the, uh, the recommended approaches, including minimal or zero till cropping. In other words, let's uh, either not till at all, or let's minimize the tillage. Let's have multi-crop rotations uh, inclu and including nitrogen fixing plants and cover crops. Let's have you know, multiple crops and uh, including nitrogen fixing plants. And let's, uh, let's have targeted micronutrient fertilizer inputs only. In, in other words, the fertilizers that we put on there are going to be targeted. It's not going to be a whole lot of you know chemical fertilizers that are salts but only targeted micronutrients high uh, a recommended practice is high intensity regenerative grazing regrowth rate related uh, recovery times in other words it's going to the the recovery time is going to be calibrated to the rate of regrowth instead of bringing the cattle back around before the field is ready. Another recommended practice is improving grazing with periodic fire or targeted treatment of woody plant expansion. And so if we do these things, what are the effects? The effects include no or minimal periods of exposed soils, less runoff and soil erosion. So you're, you're not losing your soil to erosion. And uh, you're not, and partly because your soils are not as ex exposed for as long of a time. Another effect is the buildup of soil nitrogen and organic carbon. You're not losing soil nitrogen. You're gaining soil nitrogen. You're not losing soil carbon. You're gaining soil carbon. And you're also gaining fungal diversity. This biological diversity is good for soil and therefore good for your production 
And uh, you know, because it's good for soil, because the soil maintains its structure, there's less erosion and, uh, and therefore less greenhouse gases being released. Another effect of these good practices is higher carbon sequestration. More of that atmospheric carbon is being stored in the ground and you're, you've got improved soil structure, you've got increased nutrient cycling. Nutrients need to cycle. They don't just sit there, they need to cycle. So you've got improved nutrient cycling, improved plant uh, species and soil, microbial and fungal function. So these are all good things. Good things resulting from good practices as opposed to bad things resulting from bad practices. And the conclusion, this is my conclusion, not theirs, but my conclusion for you is that livestock or crops can both be either good or bad for the climate. It depends on the management practices. Uh, it's not the cow, it's the how. So, you know, this idea that livestock is bad and that it and that crops are good that plant-based diet is good that growing our food from plants is good it's just sloppy logic sloppy reasoning and sloppy science so i'm here to oppose sloppiness in science sloppiness in reasoning and sloppiness in science. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you for your time.